Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Deaf Visual Arts Festival, DVAF, the seventh workshop this month. Oh, it's been a tremendous month so far. First, I want to introduce myself. My name is Tony Nitko. And I am the coordinator of the Deaf Visual Arts Festival. This is the fifth year that we've hosted this festival. So that's something to be celebrated. Um, I'll give a visual description. I'm a white gentleman. I have silver curly hair. I have a little bit of a white beard. I'm wearing a light blue shirt with a collar. In my background, I have a shelf to one side with some boxes that have yet to be unpacked. <laughs> we recently moved. And I also, to the other side of me, have a painting setting up that I started uh, 10 years ago and haven't finished yet. Uh, and the painting looks like an ocean and a bridge and a pier overlooking the ocean with some plants, sort of like a jungle coming into view. Um, I do have some light reflecting off of it from the window, and I'm sorry for that. I hope it's not too distracting. So that's my visual description and who I am. I do have a couple of kind of things I want to explain before we get started. Some of you might like to use closed caption, and you can access that at the bottom of the screen by clicking on the CC. And you can set to whatever um, motion that you need, whether it needs to be large or small, coloring, that sort of thing. And you can move the caption to whatever part of the screen you would like to have them placed. During the presentation, um, it is not going to be open to questions during the actual presentation. However, questions can be held until the end. But if a question pops into your mind during it, go ahead and type it into the Q&A chat section. It's called Q&A. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen. Click on that and a window will open. So you can go ahead and type all of your questions in there and I can use those um, at the end. I will actually sign those to the presenter, Nancy Work, And if you throw questions in the chat, I'm not going to see that in the regular questions. I might overlook those in the regular chat. So please be sure to put your question in the Q&A chat section. Um, I guess that's it for the housekeeping. Let me go ahead and introduce Nancy Rourke. Nancy, can you please turn on your camera? Hi there. Hi, Tony. I have known Nancy for probably five years now. Um, we've spent a lot of time together during those five years. And we had met maybe previously, but we really got to know each other and work together in a variety of projects during the last five years. And Nancy's attended the Deaf Visual Arts Festival. I've learned so much from this woman. She's so amazing. And uh, she's actually made me who I am today. I am thrilled that she is here tonight to do her presentation about the life of indigenous um, Native American artists. And so I'm thrilled to see this presentation, deaf artists. I'm gonna turn it on over to Nancy and I'm gonna turn my camera off. See you in a little bit. Tony, thank you again. Folks, hello. I am Nancy, Nancy Rourke, and this is my name sign, N3.
And now I'll give a visual description. In my background, there is an art studio. It is my art studio. I have some of the lights off so I can better show up in the foreground. I have a dark background. I have art supplies and materials surrounding me and it's quite messy. I apologize for that. I have a desk to my right side with a window and I have brown hair. I am wearing glasses. I have on a black sweater. And I'm going to go ahead and begin with the presentation. I will be sharing a PowerPoint and let me begin that now. Let me check in, make sure. Can everyone see me okay? I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement, not recognition, but a land acknowledgement, which takes our thoughts and our mind and our emotions in our heart to recognize and acknowledge our ancestors that have been here. There is a website that if you type your address into, that website will show you the land where you stand, what tribes or bands were there. And so we'll start with me. I sit, sleep, eat, and cherish the area where I live. And I am in Loveland, Colorado. The Arapaho, land of the Arapaho and land of the Dakota, as well as the Lakota and the Ute, as well as the Nakota. Now I'll talk to you briefly about my background. I am originally from California, an area known as San Diego, and I am an enrolled member of the Mesa Grande Band of Mission Indias. From the Kumeyaay Nation. Again, that is located in San Diego, California. And I'd like to give you just a minute so that you can look over the map that I have. And I've got the location highlighted and you can see where the Kumeyaay Nation is located. There are 12 and actually the number is 13. There are 13 tribes and bands. Now, when we use the word band, that indicates a smaller tribe. There are 13 federally recognized tribes there within the nation. So you see I have a red outline around the Mesa Grande area. That is where my family is from. At the bottom right corner of the screen share window, you can see a round reddish looking circle. That is our tribal flag. There are also two sculptures that are there in the image. And those sculptures show what our traditional ancestors looked like in the past. At that time, California had a total of 21 missions. The Spanish had colonized the area after they arrived. And took the native people, made them slaves, and put them to work in building those missions. The first mission that was built was in San Diego. So if you move north from San Diego to San Francisco, and think about that entire area, there are 21 missions there. And you can also see two images towards the top of my screen share. One is my mother. She's holding me as a baby. And we are there at the reservation. And you can see my father. Now he is from the Kumeyaay Nation. And he is standing with my oldest sister next to him in his arms.
My parents, my mother and my father, have an interesting story as far as when they first met. And what I'll do is I will go ahead and condense that for you. My mother moved to California from Michigan. And when she moved down from Michigan, she landed in Indian country, which was interesting because that's what led her to meeting my father. Let's fast forward some time in the future. My mother ended up moving uh, back to the reservation at some point because her health uh, was deteriorating. And at one point, I went and stayed with my mother and also lived on the reservation, and I took care of her. Uh, my mom was sick at the time. And I was there with her until she passed. She and my father both are buried on the reservation. And I'd like to show you an image of that. What you see there is on the reservation. And you see that there are there is a burial site there. Well, I have plenty of relatives there, aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, and they're buried there. You can also see that there's an older building towards the back. And that is one of the few old buildings that were a part of the missions that were built. And the one towards the bottom is a chapel. And that building is still there. It's very old and decrepit, but there is an effort to conserve it, preserve it. And we are hoping to raise the funds to be able to, at one point, update and restore the building. But that image is a current representation of what that area looks like. Moving on to the next slide. And the sign is not chief as in boss, but the sign is this way, chief. And I'd like to talk about Chief Geronimo. Chief Geronimo is a distant relative of mine. His mother was my third great, well, my great, great aunt. If you are interested and in looking towards learning more, about my heritage, you can go ahead and look at the website at the bottom of the image where it says Kumeyaay Info. Okay, next slide. At this point, I can start the evening's conversation. I'd like to talk about deceased native deaf artist. And we'll go ahead and start with John T. Williams. John T. Williams. He was a member of the Nun Chaluth tribe in Canadian territory. Now, you can see on the map that I have on the share, it's dark green, that particular area. But John specifically lived within Washington State. If you see towards the bottom of the map, it almost looks like a pointy triangle. That's actually a portion of Washington State, the Pacific Northwest. That's the area where John T. Williams was from. Oops, other direction. Here we go. This is an image of John T. Williams. John was born in 1960. John passed away in 2010. He was 50 at the time. Now John was deaf in one ear and he was a seventh generation woodcarver. 
John first started sculpting totem poles at the age of four years old. At that age, he was already making totem poles. Again, let me say at four years old. And from that point forward, he always had on him his wood carving knife. And that was just the tradition of his. Uh, he carried his knife with him his whole life. He always had his wood sculpting knife with him. Now you can see there are some beautiful totem poles in the images that I have on the share. Those are totem poles that were made by John T. Williams. And they, he's made them in various sizes. And you can actually see, if you look closer, John is holding a piece of wood in his arms. That is actually a totem pole that he is working on. John also has a brother by the name of Rick. John and Rick were extremely close. And John was a sweet and tender person. His brother Rick has been an advocate and has fought for Native rights. And Rick, of course, cared dearly for his brother. However, there is an unfortunate turn to John's story. He was killed. The situation happened that John was in Seattle, a city in Washington. John was walking down the street. And of course, John had his wood carving knife on him, as he always did. And he was approached by police officers who saw his knife. And they kept calling to him. They asked him to drop his knife. And they called it out over and over again. However, John is deaf and was unable to hear them. It was at that point where he was shot by the police four times in four seconds at 4.12 p.m. And that happened on August 30th. And John was killed right there on the scene, on the spot. His life was taken and he lay dead. The entire tribe was very upset. And Rick, John's brother, also experienced this tragic event and was also upset. The tribe filed a lawsuit against the Seattle Police Department. However, those police officers were able to walk away free. They did resign. And that was one of the outcomes. Rick and the tribe went to work and built a totem pole and painted it as well. A totem pole that is 34 feet tall. They then set that totem pole up and stood it up. It's a beautiful totem pole. And that was in memory and honor of Rick's brother, John. Now, on a yearly basis, on August 30th, Rick and a few other members of the tribe make a visit to the location where the totem pole is set in honor of John's memory. And what they do is they pay attention to the time. And at 4.12 p.m. on August 30th is when they gather and have their emotional moment together, which I find very touching. Next slide. Now I'd like to talk about Samuel Ash. Samuel Ash is another deaf native artist. And Samuel was from the Ojibwe tribe. And they are located in Canada. If you look on the map that I'm showing, 
It says Sioux Lookout. That is where Samuel Ash was born. Samuel Ash's name sign is like this, two fingers on the chin. Samuel was born. Here's an image of Samuel. Again, name sign is two fingers on the chin. And this is a slide I, I wanted. I'll give you a minute just to look at the slide. Go ahead and do that now. Okay. Samuel was born in 1951. And Samuel's mother died when Samuel was only two years old. Samuel, at some point, while he was young, became very ill and was taken to a hospital where he became deaf. However, when he was ready to leave the hospital, he was never returned to his home family, to his home and his family. Instead, the hospital took him and placed him in a foster home. Samuel did attend a deaf school, and that was the Ontario School for the Deaf in Belleville, Ontario. And he was enrolled there when he was six years old, and that's when he learned how to paint. Samuel never attended an art school and hadn't done that before, of course, at that age, and he is a self-taught artist. Samuel, I must say, also experienced a very rough life. Samuel spent time in prison. And while he was incarcerated, he worked on his painting. After he was released from prison, he enrolled in treatment, a rehabilitation program. And when he finished with that program, he returned to continuous focus on his painting. Samuel was also an alcoholic. He drank and painted, drank and painted, and repeated the cycle off and on here and there. Samuel experienced a very lonely life and had some depression. Samuel's paintings focus heavily on the Ojibwe culture. All his paintings reflect that. And Samuel was inspired by a well-known artist who was also Ojibwe. And that artist's name is Norval Morisot. Norval's paintings look like this. And I'm holding up a book now to the screen. If you can see the images, I'm holding up a book to the screen. Norville's art focused more on the spiritual and native culture, while Samuel's art focused more on nature and animals or beings and people, beings. And this is a sign for people. Samuel also uses or used very vivid colors. And the reason for that, again, is because he has a dark, had a dark side, uh, which was a hidden side to many. And when Samuel painted, he was able to fully express himself through those vivid and bright colors. And those paintings actually serve as a comforting tool to him and uh, helped him work through the dark themes in his life. Now, Samuel became extremely famous and extremely well known. He was very successful. His paintings are housed in museums, 
and locations throughout the world. So much so that the Queen of England owns a painting of Samuels. She has one installed at her house. Samuel's life, he lived in Thunder Bay after becoming a professional artist. And most of Samuel's paintings are made with acrylic paints and not oil paints. As far as Samuel's health, at some point, it did eventually deteriorate. He did get worse. And at one point, he became homeless. Samuel slept on the streets in Toronto as a homeless person. And he lived that way until a news reporter from a local newspaper company in Toronto, saw him laid out on the streets, approached him, and decided to take him to find a place for him to live, eat, and sleep, and provide that shelter so that Samuel could recuperate from his issues. Samuel attended a deaf school and visited deaf schools to present and speak about his experiences as a homeless person and to share his journey. Samuel died of a heart attack this year, 2021, uh, in April, April 21st. He was 69 years old. Okay, let's move forward to the next slide. Another deceased native deaf artist is a wood sculptor. This was a, this particular artist's specialty. And this artist is John Lewis Clark. He was from Montana. And he was a member of the Blackfoot Reservation. In the Blackfeet Nation. And that's in Canada and both the United States. If you could see on the map, there's the darker green that is shaded in. And it straddles both countries. Now there's a smaller subsection that says Blackfeet Reservation in orange. That's where John Lewis Clark is from. Here is an image of John. And I'll give you a second to look at the slide. John was born in 1881 in Montana. John's father was Scottish and his mother was Blackfoot. Now John became deaf at the age of three. He fell ill, had a fever, the scarlet fever, and became deaf. Now John attended three different deaf schools. First, he went to the Montana School for the Deaf, and he was only there a brief amount of time. But that is where he first learned wood carving. John's family and his native friends called him Katapui. Katapui means the man who does not talk. 
And the sign for it is this here. See that? This one finger indicates man. Moving forward from the mouth is talk. And the flipping of my hand means not. Or no, it could mean either not or no. So the man who talks not. The second deaf school that he attended was NDSD, which is North Dakota School for the Deaf. John first learned Plains Indian Sign Language, known as PISL, there. Then John attended SJSD, which is St. John School for the Deaf. And that is in Wisconsin. It was there that John learned about anatomy of animals. Uh, he learned the bone structure and all the different shapes and styles and how the bodies of animals work, which he studied, drew, measured, and worked with. However, John also had extremely well penmanship, and he had a very good control of any writing instrument or any painting instrument. He produced some beautiful pieces of art, and John, of course, was extremely talented. Okay, so I just covered the three deaf schools that John attended, and I'll move on. As John grew up, he was not connected to his native heritage. He was not familiar with his roots. And he also experienced a lot of communication frustration because there was trouble communicating with others. John loved fishing, camping, hunting, hiking, and spending time in nature and in the mountains. He was very drawn to nature. He loved studying animals landscapes, even uh, like, for example, mountain goats, bears, and bison. Uh, this is a sign for bison here, almost looks like buffalo. He watched eagles very carefully, and he produced many, many wooden carvings. And you could see some of them in the picture. John was always focused on a sculpture. And at some point, he reached instant fame. John started his own business. He worked from home. He set up an art gallery in 1913, again, at his home in Montana. And it's actually near Glacier National Park, which is a beautiful area. And John's artwork is still there to this day. So you can visit if you would like to. In 1927, John went to the Chicago Institute of Art to study painting. He spent two months there. It was a brief amount of time. But in 1934, he was invited to exhibit his artwork and his paintings. They were showcased at an international exhibit for deaf artists uh, in New York at New York City. There were individuals from 12 different countries and, of course, an audience from around the world. And those uh, individuals from 12 different countries were the ones who had their work showcased in that exhibit. When that was done, John decided to stay in New York City and work at New York University. And he taught at the summer program there. He taught wood carving. When that was done, John returned to Montana, his home site. And that was sometime in the 1940s. 
John taught wood carving at the Montana School for the Deaf. In 1949, John was in a silent worker, was in a magazine called Silent Worker. It's a magazine put out by the deaf community. It was 1949, and it had a red cover on the front. It was a beautiful publishing that time. And John was spotlighted in that publishing. John passed away in 1970. Okay, next slide. I'd like to point out the red circle you can see on that image. Now, that mural you see is carved out of wood. And I should say it looks like a mural. It's not actually a mural. It is actually something called a friezy, which is a basically mural carved out of wood. Now, of course, that's a very heavy sizable piece of wood that has been beautifully carved into what you see. And that one is called Blackfoot Encampment. Now again, back to the red circle I initially mentioned. What does that look like? What do you see in that image? That is possibly sign language that we're seeing there. There is a little bit of deaf art going on in that carving. I find it fascinating and interesting. Moving on to the next image. This is another one of John's paintings. And this piece is called, What Buffalo? And you can see that the two individuals there are communicating in sign language. It's beautiful. You can see the imagery, imagery there coming from a deaf artist. Now I'd like to talk about current Native Deaf artists. I selected two. I know there are plenty more of other Deaf artists. Like, for example, Deaf artists that do beadwork. Deaf artists that work with soapstone and carve that out. As well as basket weavers. Um, other individuals that work with wooden masks and many, many more. However, there are so many, and I could only select two for tonight. Hopefully in the future, we can have an art show or an art exhibit that fully features current native deaf artists. My fingers are crossed for that to happen. However, let's return to the slide. Jeff is from Oklahoma, and the sign for the Cherokee is this one. Again, people of the trees, the Cherokee. Uh, and Jeff does beautiful artwork. He has beautiful portrait paintings. You can see at the top left is a piece of art highlighting Turtle Island. And Turtle Island covers an area from Canada all the way down to South America. All of that is contained within the shape of the turtle, which is why it's referred to as Turtle Island. Another artist that I would like to highlight is from Canada, and this individual's name is Tori Ironstar. Tori's artwork is beautiful, again, using Bold, vivid colors in his imagery. I love Tori's work. Now, both Jeff and Tori, I have not had the pleasure of meeting yet. I am hopeful that I will have a chance to meet them someday in the future. Okay, moving on to the next slide. I want to have a little conversation about the Dawes House, which is located at Gallaudet University. 
you see there's a sign in front of a red brick building. That sign has now been covered. That name, Dawes, has been retired and removed from the building. Temporarily, it's being referred to as Building 103. As we speak, that is the current situation. This has been a big achievement from the Native community. They have fought and fought to have that name, Dawes, removed from the house there. And the reason for it is because Dawes is a traumatic name for many deaf Native students. When they arrive to Gallaudet and they see that name, it resurfaces the trauma and causes unpleasurable feeling. The reason for it is because this connects to Henry L. Dawes. He was from Massachusetts. He was a senator there. And he was very close to Edward Minor. Gallaudet. They were really close friends. And Dawes contributed huge sums of money and funding to help build Gallaudet University. And he also contributed huge sums of money to support deaf education. So there is a positive in that. However, on the dark side of things, Dawes was horrendous to, deaf na to natives. Dawes incepted the Dawes Act in February 8th of 1887. And I think I got that right, that year right. I'm not sure if I'm exact on it. The impact of that was that Indians and Native people, especially in the Oklahoma area, there were five tribes in that area, they were removed from their lands. And located somewhere else where they were given small amounts of land. And then the remaining plots of land were sold to white men. Another action implemented by Dawes was something called the Dawes Mission, the Dawes Commission, which forced Native Americans to have to enroll and sign into an agreement where they had to cut their hair, they had to speak like white people spoke, and they also had to dress like white men uh, so that they could assimilate, which was horrendous because, of course, it stole their own culture from them. And there have been multiple impacts to other Native tribes, including my own family's tribe. Because my tribe at the Indian school were also forced to have to cut their hair and bathe all the time and scrub and scrub constantly in order to not look dirty. We also had the English only rule applied. We couldn't speak any native language. And so the reach and implications of Dawes action have been pretty widespread. However, I can happily say that the Dawes name has been retired and this building is currently known temporarily as building 103. We have had conversations amongst deaf native Americans and there is the hope that we can add a Native American name to that building sometime in the future. I have a website link there showing that you can visit. Okay, moving on to the next slide. I'm gonna show you some signs. First sign I like to start with is the sign for indigenous. Okay, place one hand on top of the other and then uh, sink your fingers into your hand. Now the base hand represents the water, the land, mountains, desert, basically Mother Earth. The four fingers sinking into the other fingers 
represent the rootedness. Okay, on to the second sign. And this is a sign for native or for Indian. And it's just like this, right? Native, Indian, either one, regardless. To the side or up to the forehead works. Now we don't sign this sign for native. And I'll tell you the reason for that. The case is that not all tribes have or use face paint. Like for example, markings on the chin, forehead, uh, sometimes uh, on the lower chin, besides the jaws. And uh, some tribes do have face paint and some don't. So there's a preference not to sign this uh, war paint sign. There is a preference to just sign Indian or native. And the sign is Indian this way because uh, in the past, bear grease or horse grease or bison grease was used for washing and cleansing. And then plants would also be scrubbed on the hair to help it smell nice and keep it illustrious and shiny because hair is considered sacred. And so that's the sign this way, this Indian. Okay, moving on to number three, the sign for good morning. We start with the sun, sun up, good. You see that? That's good morning. So again, sun up good. Moving on to the fourth sign for good uh, to indicate agree or to say someone good job or if you want to say amen, I agree, right? It's this sign right here. That's good. Moving on to the fifth sign on the list, reservation or as some call it, just res. And I just use this sign right here. Or you could just sign R-E-Z for res. Okay. The sixth sign on the list is tribe. That's this sign here, tribe. Seventh, seventh sign on our list is medicine. And I'll do that again here for you. See the number two kind of wisping upwards. And our eighth sign for tonight, crazy horse. If you're familiar with the South Dakota area, it's, it's not crazy horse, it's this way. See that? Wild or crazy, and then horse. Now I'd like to share with you some key dates to remember. Next week on September 30th, it is Orange Shirt Day. So wear an orange shirt. And this is to honor the memory of Native children that were killed in Canada at the residential schools, at the Native residential schools. We have lost many children there. And so we want to hold their memory and then honor them by wearing an orange shirt. And as you can see, the second date I have listed on the slide is October 11th. And this day is now being called Indigenous Peoples Day. It is no longer being referred to as Columbus Day. There has been a change. And so we are now celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day. It is a holiday. We want to celebrate and honor as well as learn history and become familiar with that history as we celebrate and learn the cultures and histories of Native Americans. The third date I have on there is November, and that is because November is Indigenous Deaf Heritage Month, which means that during the month of November, you may see Indigenous leaders sharing or having discussions about their culture or any other subject uh, like language, uh, their background, backgrounds on their tribes, background about reservations. And there is just so much to learn during that month of November. Okay, I think that about completes my presentation for tonight.
Yay, Nancy, I learned so much. I actually found some questions uh, that were coming up in the chat. Or I pulled the questions coming on the chat. John Williams, wait, no, you said John T. Williams. He was a sculptor, right? You said a totem poles. So there's a question in the chat. How many totem poles did John actually make? Do you know? Tony, you know, I'm not exactly sure, but I could say multiple, many, from two inches tall to standing you know, number of feet high. Now, his brother, Rick, I'm sure would know. I could actually reach out to Rick and I can ask him if he has a total number. Okay. I personally, um, I don't know if you can expound upon it, but as far as uh, the totem poles themselves, they have the different faces on there. What do those mean? This is a question that I have. Wow, Tony. Yes. Well, the totem poles with the different symbols, like, for example, they'll have an animal, a bear, an eagle, a raven, or, or, or different animals represented. They represent different meanings. Each animal represents a, a particular meaning. Like spirituals or? Um... Yes, yes, Tony. Spiritual and extremely sacred. Yes. Oh. And also, uh, they provide a good omen. They provide good energy. They provide a good oh, outlook. Do they protect the tribe then? Were they there that, to protect the tribe? Yes, Tony. And there are multiple meanings to it. And really the design and the way the animals are arranged and which animals in particular and the total number of animals it has a special meaning and they all have different meanings and represent something. Yes. Oh, great, Nancy. Thanks. Um, and then in the very beginning of your presentation, I think you spoke about where your tribe was coming from in Southern California. And the name of the town you said was San Juan. Um, in the interpreter. Capistrano, California. San Juan Capistrano, California, you said, Tony? Uh, yeah, that's that's nearby. So the chapel that you showed in the picture, I saw that. Has that turned into a museum now? Actually, Tony, yes. That is one of 21 missions. Uh, there, yeah, there are many more. And it's just the one of them. Spanish pe people came in. Um, yeah, they pretty the, much whipped the natives into slave, slavery, and oh, the natives so the had Jesuits, to build the missions. They said that you had to um, follow God and because of their yeah. beliefs. So the natives, the reservations, do they still practice their own religion, or have they been converted to, over the years? Do you know? Tony, well, uh, they still have some of the practices. We have our own spiritual path not so much religion it's not considered a religion but it's more of a, a relationship uh with nature with the stars with the land and a feeling of connectedness uh, to all within that relationship there is a lot of ceremonies that take place uh, and there is a different count and a different calendar and, and different right seasons when when those ceremonies are held. Now, as far as our religion, that's a mixed response. Yes or no. Some individuals are Catholic and uh, that's usually because they've grown up that way. Sure. If they were exposed by their parents and uh, exactly in that manner. So I'm in Tucson, Arizona, and I do go to the San Xavier Mission, and um, it's parallel to the story that you're explaining. So it's very interesting to about your reservations. Let me see. There were some other questions. Sure. Someone asked about Samuel, and I believe this is the name sign, correct, Samuel? Um, 
did he ever yeah. find his family? Do you uh, know? I know he was taken away from his father, but did he, was he ever reconnected uh, with them? I'm not really sure, to be honest, Tony, but I can definitely look further into that. Oh, it's just such a touching story. It is. And sad. I mean, he had such a rough life. And it's not just Samuel. There are experiences just like that in many other tribes because a native person's life is always rough. Yeah. That's so atrocious. Let's see. Another question. And this is me asking that before I look at one of their questions. I noticed a lot of the art that you showed are the vivid colors that were being used. Um, and I know in your work, you tend to use vivid colors. I sure do. Yeah. Um, can you maybe reflect on why you picked those bright colors and why you, you tend to use it? Tony, for me, bright colors always cheer me up and they're eye catching, right? But are, is it only related to native things? Because you, you had a lot of native things that were brightly colored. Well, colors that are commonly used within the native community are red, black, and yellow. Uh, we do have our medicine wheel, right? And those are typically red, black, white, and yellow. And that symbolizes the north, the south, the west, and the east. And it represents each group. So, yeah, I would have to agree. Bright colors are a part of me. Yeah. Oh, it's just fascinating to me, um, the things that you're teaching us about the Native heritage. That's it's and the signs that you taught. Um, so the signs for native and the sign for smoke. Is there a sign for snow smoke? Do you know? Uh, there is, but I don't know the sign for smoke yet. I am still learning Plains Indian Sign Language. And, you know, there isn't just Plains Indian Sign Language, but there are living natives that are using their own sign language at this point. Yeah, so I still have a lot to learn. That's awesome. Okay, let's see. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, it looks like I covered them. Um, I did have a few questions from people that were asking me, Tony, um, whether or not this event would be recorded. And yes, it is being recorded. I've recorded the entire event and it will be uploaded to the Deaf Visual Arts Festival. Um, so you will be able to see that again. Uh, all of the previous workshops that have taken place are in the middle of being edited, and then they will be placed on the page. So feel free to go back and look at any of the events that have happened, the old events, not old, but things that recently happened this month. And... Oh. I was going to say something and now, oh, oh yes, uh, somebody said something about a last minute thing. Um, for the Plains Indian Sign Language, was it? Right, Tony, that's, yes, P-I-S-L. P-I-S-L, okay. <laughs> Plains Indian Sign Language, okay, P-I-S-L, sure, P-I-S-L. Um, is that limited to a specific tribe that uses it or is that more kind of a universal language? No, you're right. It is a specific uh, tribe, specific region, mostly, of course, in the Plains area or the Plains region, like Nebraska, so Colorado, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, yes, Iowa, uh, kind of that area, Oklahoma included. Would Texas and, be included? Maybe uh, the northern part? I, I think that entire Plains area would be included, yeah pretty much where the hurricane alley that they call. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Missouri too. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, are there any books available 
on native sign language, either the Plains Indian Sign Language or any other? I'm sure there are. They're a little older, but they're written by the white man. There's one by Tom Hawkins, if I have that spelling correct. Now, Tom Hawkins is out of San Diego, and he did meet uh, some deaf natives and learned signed, and he drew them down to document them. He drew them on paper to document them. But the manner in which it was done is not appropriate. People like John Lewis Clark, he used PISL on a regular basis. And he had friends uh, in a circle that hung out and communicated with each other in PISL. So, and, and, and that is something that continues to this day within those circles. And there are new signs also being developed. However, in order to do that, the deaf natives from the various tribes have to come to an agreement whenever a new sign is developed. And really what's happening is we're pulling from other tribes and we're supporting each other to replete the language. And it's something that's constantly going. Every now and then, Tony, I use PISL in my conversations. I have a couple, maybe more than a couple of deaf people here at the reservation that I interact with that way. I do want to apologize to the audience members. I did overlook um, a couple of the questions. So I'm sorry, I'm going to go back there and pay attention to the questions in the Q&A. Um, nobody told that I didn't get a warning that there was a new message. So I didn't know messages were hidden. So I have scrolled and I'm finding your question. So I apologize to the audience members for that. Okay, um, how many tribes are left in the country? Tony, there are about 575 federally recognized oh. tribes. Again, just emphasis on that federally recognized part. But I should say there are many other tribes that exist without that federal recognition yet. And there are also many other tribes that have been lost, are now gone, and have been taken from us. This is why we need to continue the fight to bring back those tribes, because there are many. But for now, the count is at about, well, let's just say an easier round number. It's almost 600. So the next question was related to John T. Williams. And they're wondering the totem pole memorial, um, is that something that people can go and visit and actually see? Yes, Tony, anyone can visit the oh, totem it's pole. Open it's to open the to the public. public. Oh. It's open to the public, right. It is actually right on, actually really close to the Space Needle in Seattle. Do you know where that's at, the Space Needle? It's right oh. there, and that is a public area. Yeah, anyone is welcome to visit. Oh, that's cool. Um, and it's it, it's its permanent and, location, correct? Yes, but here's the thing. If you want to visit on August 30th, you'll be in the company of other tribes. Oh, so it's open to the public, right? It's yeah. um, You don't yeah. have to be a native to actually visit, correct? Um, you could uh, pay tribute there. Oh. You sure can, Tony. And I've, I've visited a few years ago. I went and uh, visited, and I must say it was just beautiful. Wow. Oh. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but are you aware of any other indigenous um, artworks within the Washington, D.C. area? Uh, you just asked about the Washington, D.C. area. I apologize. I am not familiar with anyone in that area. No. Okay. So 
So someone is asking or wanted to ask you if you are planning to make a change, a shift and start to do different subjects and maybe painting more indigenous, make that your focus? I have been doing that. I just haven't shared those those art pieces of artwork, but eventually <laughs> I will. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing that work then. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I will, yes. Okay, let's see. So the, the wood artist, the native mural wood art, does that show a proper connection between the deaf people and the land? I believe so, Tony, and it looks like it does. That type of woodwork, I'm still looking into because I'd like to know much more and especially on that particular piece, I am hoping to be able to go to the museum in Montana. Uh, they have a, a gallery where you can visit. And John Lewis Clark's uh, granddaughter operates and runs that particular art gallery and it continues to this day. So she is running it and I would like to visit one day to be able to have a conversation and ask some of the questions that I have about that particular a uh, wooden mural that freezy. Yes. Oh, I bet there'd be some interesting stories. <laughs> oh, I bet. So fascinating stories, I'm sure. Okay, I think I've caught up with all of the questions now. A few people are really encouraging you to establish um, an ex exhibition of some sort and showing all of the deaf indigenous artists. So yes, the native artists and maybe make it a traveling tour someday. Oh, okay. Let me see. I believe, no, maybe there's one last. So somebody wants to compliment the interpreter and the wonderful job that he has done. And also wants to know if you've worked with native ASL interpreters in the past. And if so, has that made a difference for you, especially when you're speaking on native topics? Is that a question you're asking the interpreter, Tony? No, I think they're asking you, do you feel differently when you're using the signs of the native and indigenous topic when you're able to get an interpreter that is native or an indigenous person? Um, does that make a difference? Um, whether they know ASL or not, does that help you um, whenever you're making your presentations? especially about this topic? And why is that? Tony, yes, it does. Uh, I did bring in an indigenous interpreter today and I'm very grateful, Tony, for you having the ability to make that happen. To be honest, I feel a lot more comfortable uh, knowing that we can work closely together because we have a shared understanding and I know that the interpreter will be able to pronounce any names uh, that I, I sure can't pronounce. And mm -hmm. the interpreter will sure. be familiar with them and be able to enunciate them correctly. Uh, and also the interpreter knows and understands some of the signs I use as well. The interpreter also has a grasp of the culture. And so with that said, I think it's important to have more of a, and, and let me find the right words for this, you know, someone that's not so much from the white system, the white man system. I just feel much more comfortable having a native interpreter because I feel like I identify with them and, and I know it's not operating within that white 
system, if, if you understand what I'm saying, if that's coming across, Tony. Totally. I totally understand what you're saying. Yes. And um, it almost parallels my experience when um, I usually have uh, Lo and Melissa, and I am so comfortable because they're involved with the art with me and with the Deaf Visual Art Festival. I always request them first because I know they know the topic. They're familiar with um, art in general, and they're, they know me. <laughs> they know how I sign. They understand me. And so I can just feel comfortable and know that my message is coming across. Mm -hmm. So I totally get where you're coming from. Um, so yes. <laughs> Agreed, Tony. Yes. Okay. Um, I think I have captured all of the questions from the audience. So I just want to give a huge thank you. And somebody from the audience by the name of Melissa Basanti um, works at the National Museum of the American Indians in Washington, D.C. Um, and said, why don't you stop by and say hello? I would love to see you. I'd be thrilled to show you around the place. So come on over. Well, I look forward to that. That seems exciting. All right, then I'm gonna have to wrap up. And in doing so, I do have um, another workshop that's taking place next Tuesday. Acting 101. So I would encourage anyone that is interested in maybe joining the theater and small roles are large roles. Come in there. We have a uh, stage or filming photography. So um, it's going to be Alexandra Williams. And oh my gosh, it's a phenomenal performer, actor. Um, it, it, you're going to learn a lot from this presentation. She was involved with um, a, 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 an amazing class. So come in, come and see Wiles. She is a code, she was in the CODA movie. And then Thursday will be the final party, the wrap up party where we're gonna announce the rewards for the exhibitions and the film festival winners. Um, so you can sign in. We have, um, uh, uh, entertainment and award ceremony. So please join us with the VV Underground. And let's see, what else did I need to say? I do need to thank our sponsors. Let me pull those up. The top four sponsors were Deaf Inc., Rochester Institute of Technology slash National Technical Institute for the Deaf, RIT, NTID. MAC, the Missouri Arts Council, the Missouri Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, abbreviated MCDHH. Those were the top sponsors and I really want to thank them. We had other um, sponsors that were still important. Convo Relay, Sorensen Video Relay Services, Communication Services for the Deaf, abbreviated CSD, Gallaudet University, the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis, the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum, and they're affiliated with Washington University. Um, without their support, this would not happen. So I have to thank them all for their wonderful support. Last and most important, we need to thank the interpreters. We have Cress and Lowe. So thank you for the wonderful job you've done tonight. And also I want to thank Catherine, who provided the captioning tonight. So thank you for your amazing service that you provided. And I think that takes care of it. So thank you for coming to the Deaf Visual Arts Festival. Please look at the website, 
dbaf at deathinc.org. So I will put that in the um, chat so you all can see that. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. And Nancy, thank you so much for your presentation. Awesome presentation. Tony, thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me here tonight. Thank you. Cheers. Everyone have a good night. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.